Hello and welcome to the Horn One Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, consider signing up for the Patreon. There you get ad-free content, early access, exclusive episodes, and monthly supporter hangouts. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Juan on Juan podcast. If you don't like the subscription-based models, there are other ways of supporting the show that are linked in the description. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this episode. They said it was forbidden. They said it was dangerous. They were right. Introducing the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual. Dive into the arcane, into the hidden corners of the occult. This isn't just a comic. It's a hidden tome of supernatural power. All original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of Juan Ayala, one of the only living homunculologists of our time. Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus. Ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day. Knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart? Available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today. Welcome to the One on One Podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. Some of these guys uh, in the 90s, early 90s, in 1993, some of them, there was about 50 arsons, I think, recorded. The churches were built on sacred pagan land, and I think some of these people knew that, and they wanted to burn it because they believed it was part of the Northern Crusade, where you know Christianity came in to kill these people and call them savages. They kind of adopted their Viking imagery more, and then they got into Satanism as a way to give the middle finger. That, and then they, they get into the actual demonology. Some of these people get into demonology, both Semitic demonology and Nordic. There's bands that are getting into that are very versed in Christianity and knowing about demonology and angels and stuff like Gabriel and or Gabriel, rather, you know, all these names being mentioned of angels and stuff like that. They're into that full mythos and, and also philosophy. Welcome back to another episode of the Juan on Juan podcast. I'm your host, as always. Make sure to follow the show on social media at the Juan on Juan podcast on pretty much a- any major platform, tjojp.com. You can also call in 407-476-4606. Leave a message. Let me know what you thought of the episode, what you think of the show. Leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. If you're on YouTube, thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. And joining us for the first and hopefully not the last time, a very special guest today, we have Wes Cage with us. Bro, welcome to the show, dude. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Appreciate you being here. Wes, can you let people know where they can find you? I don't know, you told me you had a right your handle on Instagram. You have anything else you want to plug? Yeah, aside from the uh, at Weston Cage Coppola uh, Instagram, there's a link tree, uh, and there's also a um, place called West Cage Emporium where I sell some of the uh, audios that I make for people for wellness and certain benefits, and also like talismans and stuff. Awesome! Yeah, I'll put send me the links, and I'll put them in the description as well. Everyone, make sure to go check that out, and. Wes, I mean, you're an interesting guy, actor, recording artist, music producer, mixed martial artist, you you know, five languages. What, what, can you tell us a little bit about you, Wes? Like what, what, tell us a little bit about you, man. Well, I think I'm just the, 
a guy that got way too inspired by polymaths like da vinci and stuff at a young age <laughs> i tried i've always wanted to do everything um well i mean i owe it to my family you know my 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 parents really made sure that i had a lot of access to a lot of amazing experts and instructors and stuff and there was always a spanish guitar a piano and an acoustic drum set in the house and a camera so of course the camera led me to becoming a filmmaker with my friends and doing little films and directing them and then all the instruments brought me to um brought me to uh, my music career and then of course the the martial arts that daily discipline of that and and stuff you know that acting school that that made me probably who i am today the most and this is the, i, I want to jump straight to the deep end what where where do you believe ideas come from right because you have weston then you have wes or you have the person then you have the actor. Where do you think, right? Let's dive first into where do you believe ideas come from, right? Where where do you think that they originate from? Are they, because it's interesting when you get an idea and if you want to get into Plato, the theory of forms, these upper worlds and, and we're drawing from those worlds. In your opinion, where do ideas come from and where, where do you draw your inspiration from? Well, I always believe that I'm, you know, I try to draw draw my inspiration from the source you know i believe that consciousness is light beyond photonic and electromagnetic light i believe that there's a that we're consciousness within consciousness so i'm always trying to pull from a divine place i know sometimes ideas will come from you know epiphanies and, and connections that we'll make based on our own memory and the data of our memory but i do think there's a collective consciousness and sometimes the akashic records or uh, there, there is a, a a realm that can send us information, and the, I believe the Creator does that. You know, um, my my spirituality is first and foremost in my life, and I, I just got done writing about, uh, you know, where that's taken me. It's introduced me to my soulmate, or Melinda, my fiance, and uh, brought me to the path I was meant for. I mean, but I, I, I put actual discipline into my spirituality, so that, that's where I'm getting my my ideas from mostly. <laughs> yeah, I saw that you posted that you're writing about animism. Yes, yeah, um, that was the exact um, writing I was thinking about. Can you tell us a little bit about that for those that don't know what animism is? Of course, uh, animism is just the belief that there's a spirit in all things. Um, it's derived from the Latin and Italian word an anima. Uh, Italian is definitely anima, meaning soul. Uh, and then it's interesting, though, just to see how potent that word is. If you look at anima, almost like a prefix as a word, the whole word being a prefix, you have animation uh you have animism you have uh you know all these things that come from that um were and it's basically believe that everything is an animated uh, spirit you know mo most all living things for sure are some people believe that that and areas have a spirit to them as well but um so i was getting into how that has to do with so much um you know and i i I really believe, you know, just the mere fact that we have more neurons than there are stars in the galaxy uh, and beyond, uh, that just shows that we're, we're like universes ourselves. Yeah, because on my show, I talk about a lot about the occult, a lot about the esoteric, a lot about alchemy, and yes. right, the, the religion is in there too. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts about, and you, know, you don't have to answer this, but what are your thoughts about God? What, do you think the universe is God? Do you think, because you, you mentioned, right, there's this aspect of intelligent design when it comes to us. We have all these neurons. We're, we are essentially a quantum computer. I mean, we're the best computer that there co could possibly ever be. And it's like, I feel like a lot of people, especially nowadays, I mean, they're not tapping into their full potential that they could, they, they're not being the be the best versions they can be now. We could talk about what's holding us back, technology being one of those, but what do you believe God is? Well, I believe God is an omnipresent, infinite source of an intelligence beyond human sophistication. You know, I the, the pretty much the first emanation that ever occurred in existence. I mean, I believe that God is an architect. Just the fact that you know, I believe spirit came first, but after that, you know, this whole universe that's infinite came from helium, hydrogen, and lithium. So 
clearly this being is scientific as well and we have a scientific design and intelligent design as you're saying 100 percent. so it's like i believe that god is a i believe that there is a both male female god goddess I, that's why i call it god goddess but that there is a um a force that basically is like an architect or grand geometer of the universe but i also believe in many spirits connected to that source and i, I think that there are you know, I, I pray to multiple angels. I pray to multiple deities. Uh, sometimes I pray to Gaia, just directly Mother Earth, because I think that gets overlooked a lot. Our responsibility as humans to protect the Earth and innocence and stuff like that. But you know, I'm 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 very uh, very spiritual. It's uh, always been a part of my life. When I was a kid, I would always say the most spiritual stuff, and people would always ask, "Is he being told this stuff?" And then. They would say no, but also we encourage it. And then as I got older, I got into mysticism around 15 and I never stopped. I mean, now it's been 18 years of of me uh, studying this stuff and it centers me. You know, some people freaks them out in numerology and all that stuff. Or, you know, I see people saying that it, there's demon, it's demonic to, to even read, read tarot cards and stuff. And it's just comical beliefs. But um, so, I mean, I am very religious but just with mysticism and i think if someone's going for be it you know islam christianity judaism zoroastrianism you know any anything that no matter where they go that they just go to the the top floor of that faith and really explore where it all becomes one you know yeah faith is is an interesting concept because i was raised pentecostal christian and i was always a bit of a, a black sheep, if you will, because I'd always ask the harder questions, the questions that they were uncomfortable to answer. And it's like, well, why are these books not in the canon and et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. I cut my teeth on Gnosticism so I can sort of answer some of these questions as far as animism, where even the, the Cathars, they believe that every single being was a a light being trapped in a body and therefore they wouldn't reproduce. So they didn't want to reproduce because if they reproduced, they would trap another light entity in a body. They wouldn't harm animals. They were pescatarians. They would only eat uh, certain fish, but they wouldn't eat any other animals. And usually people like this, right? The Cathars, they're usually wiped out the Gnostics. They're usually wiped out because obviously to the victor, the spoils. So we have a lot of, you know, hi history is, is, is a weird thing but yeah I, I can relate to that where it's like i was always told i was told don't read the book of enoch because you're gonna get possessed right it's like well and you know, just about angelic you know yeah but that's the trip yeah and it's interesting because it's it it paints a picture that is other wor more otherworldly than than the main it's like the the main story is already otherworldly throw this book in there and it's even crazier right yeah. And what are your, <laughs> this is a fun question. What are your thoughts on aliens, bro? What do you, what do you think the, these things are? Well, I, I think for me, like aliens, you know, it, hermeticism always answered that for me where it says as above, so below, you know, where um, it's kind of telling us that, you know, as within, so without as the source of the universe, I believe that since there's intelligent life here, it would be ir irrational to believe that in the entirety of the universe that there's no aliens you know it's just it's like saying there's fish in the pacific ocean but the atlantic are devoid of any life and there's the void and then the mediterranean there's nothing there but pacific we're all here man like you know so to me it's it's narcissistic delusional yeah and i think that even maybe some religions have done that to us right they they've made it to so where they just focus on i always joke around about this but where some religions they focus on living preparing for the afterlife that you're not living the actual life like your life now here on earth because they degrade and they demean this reality right because because you're promised a, a better one like i remember as a kid like you're gonna right, you're gonna go to heaven it's gonna be perfect it's gonna be worship all the time you're gonna have a mansion of gold the streets are gonna be gold it's like wow is this atlantis <laughs> you know? no it's it's a lot you know th there's some all these books are amazing because they they can be read in different ways different levels like uh at least in the torah you know what people can go sold peshuts where it's, it's like secret they're reading it in the secret ways the old testament or 
they're reading it in a more literal way or they're reading it in some way that, I mean, I know that even they took a, a lot, there's a lot of verbiage from Jesus that the gospel of Thomas, for example, that he wanted to be really understood forever. is very similar to some Buddhist statements about, I, I think I remember every, every word of it. It's um, if, if kingdom is in the sky, the birds precede you. If kingdom is in the water, the fish precede you. Kingdom is within. And he was, Jesus was trying, Yeshua ben Yosef was trying to say, there is, if you, their kingdom is within you and kind of what you were saying, like that, that, that consciousness within. So it's, um, it's interesting how stuff, some, some stuff got taken out and then some things got demonized. And I, even, even the female aspects of God that were in the really old, faith of Yahwism where like you know where where um Yahweh was one of the gods in this that that all came from from that stuff and you know Ashura and all the some of the female gods in the 10th century I believe it was the 10th century they started getting demonized or called names and stuff but yeah or even mistranslated they were actually women turned to men etc cetera, etc cetera. so i look at history as a big game of telephone and i've always told people right i reserve my right i i do believe in jesus christ i do believe in god but i consider myself a scholar i consider myself a researcher so i'm going to look into these different things and it's not going to sway me from my core beliefs right i think it was aristotle that said it's the mark of an energetic an educated man to discuss things without believing them and i think that I was saying there's a lot of people who are literal. And I mean, dude, there's 45,000 different denominations of Christianity. I'm sure they'll be all right. <laughs> See, that's an example right there just of how, like, yeah, there's so many versions of it. It's it's That's why the mysticism is so important to where it all connects, with, like the Rosicrucian and mm -hmm. Gnosticism. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I had another question for you here. So... Acting. Well, let's first start out with your with your music, right? Yeah. Your days in was it the eyes of Noctum? Yes. What kind of genre is that? Because I am a guitarist. I Amazing. I've done a, 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 my fair share of head banging, even though I don't have sweet hair like you in those days, or you had the long hair. But I. Grew up listening. I think my first screamo band that I listened to was because you and I aren't that much in age. You're you're 33. I'm I'm 29. I'm about to be 30 next month, so we're kind of close there. So I had the Devil Wars Prada, Alessana, as Blood Runs Black, Shadows Fall, which is a little bit different. A day to remember. They're from Florida, and then I remember I I, I progressed to something like more hardcore, Chelsea Grin, Suicide Silence, like that sort of stuff. And I grew up on that sort of music, and I was listening to your your vocals, dude. They're sick. Like, Thank you so. Much. What is it? Uh, what got you into music, and what ended up happening? You guys broke up. You guys, do you have? I know you put out a new song, "The Wolf," which is also excellent. Can you talk to us a little bit about your music? Of course, definitely. Yeah. So I mean, um, it's funny what what I loved first is kind of what I'm coming back to, even in my my metal music. Um, and even in the extreme metal that I did, there was always a very spiritual kind of new age element to it. Uh, so, I mean, I started off with listening to Enya and a lot of music that came from different parts of the world. I, I would even have people ask me to, to name a country and I would start playing the piano and start playing scales within the modality that that country uses or modalities that the country uses. And I started just expanding more and more. And then after I got good at doing the kind of like world ethnic music from all over, particularly Mediterranean and Middle East and in India and the Scandinavia as well, I, I moved on to doing extreme metal. Um, my first favorite band was System of a Down and Rammstein, but I, I went more to a extreme metal, you know, uh, kind of more of a behemoth cradle of filth, demon warrior sound. The, the type of music I was doing in Eyes of Noctum was symphonic black metal. Then from there, I went into kind of a metal, new metal sound, which is where West Cage, the true music I, I've always wanted to do is. And then you have songs like The Wolf that are very much so active rock and, and uh, stadium friendly that can connect with the whole world. No one feels like they're they're doing something uh, illegal by, you know, like some of the black metal, um, 
<laughs> it just what do you mean by that, Wes? It not, you said not doing something illegal. Was there stuff going on that was illegal during your eyes of knocked them? Like, well, the uh, nothing illegal was going on, but I do know that you know sometimes friends that I would show show things to, like a friend of mine. He's no longer a friend of mine, but he was one of my buddies that was like into Christianity, Coptic uh, Christian, so Egyptian. He was checking it out uh, and also a video from Behemoth. And he's like, oh, I feel bad for liking this because he was so, you know, he was raised with with, with being devout and, and with the light. And then there's all this dark imagery in the Behemoth video, which is blackens, uh, blackens death metal. So I get into the, dark, the subject of darkness and stuff. Anyway, he's like, oh, I feel bad for liking him. And I, I'd always laugh because some people, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want to admit that they like the sound. And then, and then I'm thinking to myself, there's there's Christian black metal. There's. <laughs> you know, there's every version of, of it all, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, people would go to these concerts, and there, there were some people that were very much so kind of trying to do what happened with the first wave of black metal, or second wave rather, in Scandinavia and in England. I mean, like in 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 you know, the, in Norway, there was some pretty severe activity. The, the government wanted to call it pagan extremism or t- pagan terrorism. Um, I don't think they really a lot of people understood what was going on. There's yeah, that's eyes of Noctum right there, and then that's the new look for the the wolf. Would you say that they were calling it paganism? Why? Pagan ex- well, I think what happened was the the Euronymous and Varg Vikernes, um, Varg Vikernes. Are there, he he. Uh, I didn't know I was Norwegian when I went to Norway. I didn't know I was part Greek and part Norwegian. So I'll go to these places and feel this connection. I'm like, man, I love it here. I knew about the Italian, and but I found out that there was like Italian, Swedish, Norwegian. Anyway, the some of these guys uh, in the 90s, early 90s, like 1993, some of them, there was about 50 arsons, I think, recorded. Uh, the churches were built on sacred... Yes. Uh, pagan land and i think some of these people knew that and they wanted to burn it because they believed it was part of the northern crusade where wow you know christianity came into the baltic and the northern countries of europe and started to kill kill these people and call them you know savages it was very similar to what happened to in 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 north america um so it just they kind of adopted their Viking imagery more and then they got into Satanism as a way to give the middle finger kind of to that um, influence uh, or I believe Lutheran even you know they were against the Lutheran influence that's very dear to the Swedish and Norwegian people and you know um, sometimes when I'd go to Norway and people would hear I was doing black metal or even when they would see my band they were wondering are we in a gang are we and we're like no we're just doing an album from California he's from Siberia we're just here making an album, you know, but um, I think that black metal's intensity, you know, it's, it's gangster rap and black metal definitely made the most frightening, I would say effects on people like to where they believe they're a part of a, you know, an organization. But uh, so it drew from the dark imagery in order to, or let's, let's not call it dark, but pagan imagery to, put forth their i guess heritage in a way like their culture and that but then it's construed as black and death because it is pagan right i mean well they that and then they they get into the actual demonology some of these people get into demonology but both semitic demonology and nordic there's bands that are getting into that are very versed in christianity and knowing about demonology and angels and stuff like gabriel and or Gabriel, rather, you know, all these names being mentioned of angels and stuff like that, they're into that full mythos um, and, and also philosophy. But, um, you know, the, the black metal stuff is just, um, it's, it's interesting. It's very rebellious. It's, it, it wants to empower the listener. Basically, like, there was demonization of a lot of holy beings like Pan, Gaia, Cernanos, Cernanos, you know, that like starting to use the kind of like sub, the the um, kind of like sabbatic goats, uh, earth creature, fawn Baphomet. energy, yeah, make yeah. It look like a devil in a way. And it's like that's like the farthest thing from a devil since the 
most animals are innocent, you know, but it's like, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that's interesting. Animals, there's a difference between, right. The, in the simulacra and simulation, Jean Baudrillard talks about the difference of animals and animals aren't violent. They're they're They have territory. It's instinct. It's different. It's primal versus man who seeks to destroy, capture all for what, for, for, for self gain and, and it, it gets, it's very weird, right? So, it is. and you mentioned something, right? The, the idea of the horns, the devil, Sir Nunos, Pan, you have Pan, Panic, Panamonian, uh, Panamonian, yeah. all that, all, the, all those feelings that come that are, that, that have those words in those God's names or whatever it is. Yeah. And Baphomet has always been, well, for one, Falconelli, which was an immortal alchemist, an immortal yeah. French alchemist for, for, I was going to say he was an immortal French alchemist for a while, but this, <laughs> this figure in alchemy that said that Baphomet is actually a representation of the great work. So it is a, an amalgam, uh, you know, it's a representation of what you need to do to complete the, the magnum opus, right? And... Yeah. It's some, there's something about symbols that are able to extract feeling from somebody. And I want to talk about acting with you here and, and motion picture and all these things, but I want to focus for a little bit on the sound because you're talking about that they use this music to invoke feelings in the listener. You said to empower them, but were they putting occult stuff and esoteric concepts in their music as a sort of ritual? How did how'd that work? I mean, there's a couple different types. I, I, I always looked at it. <clears throat> Someone's going to get into black metal. There's there's the cosmic and anti-cosmic stuff. So there, there's some black metal that really is misanthropic and it hates humanity. And I, I don't like that kind of black metal. It doesn't speak to me. But there is one that is spiritual and kind of connected to being empowered and kind of like the, the, the black flame, you know, all these, all these symbols and, and all this terminology. But like, and it gets into all, you know, philosophy and, and uh occult and you know esoterica but uh that that the, the kind of stuff that's better is definitely the with the lyrics that are kind of like like god's second hand the song i did where i'm talking about excellent the fall song of, by the way oh thank you so much i appreciate you i i wanted to mention the fall of, of lucifer but then show it reverse saying whatever goes down can come up again based off the aphorism that whatever goes up must come down and i, I was thinking because i was trying to inspire people with that kind of mentality or you know a song that came later uh left hand of god by behemoth that kind of brought up something similar was like this this force is a part of god not i'm not into an opposer <laughs> and i don't i i think that you know i was talking to a very dear friend of mine an impeccable director a cfac bar i was talking to him yesterday we we're talking a little bit about you know spirituality and and you know the 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 difference of these these forces um you know how i've even mentioned how sometimes people who think they're doing something in the name of the light they're actually doing something horrific and you know they're going against the light they're becoming <clears throat> the other end they're going so far left or right that they're wrapping around to the, the the opposite so you know case in point with like crusaders and stuff that decided to kill innocent people that were just worshiping trees and god and then this is demonic but we'll take the christmas tree from them <laughs> and we'll celebrate that you know, it's just very it's like it's it's it saddens me that that happened paganism to me you know i i, I believe in in both monotheistic and kind of polytheistic beliefs because i believe it all came from one that there's multiple so it's kind of both in a way but i just you know, I, I, I think that we were all connected. We were all one people. Everyone was pagan at one point. And with some of the violence that we're seeing right now in West Asia, um, it, it makes me sad for the, the I, I know that Abraham wouldn't have liked to have watched what's going on between the children he created, the, the Christian, the Muslim, the, the Jewish you know, I, I don't think he would he would have liked that. I think the Baha'i are the only one that are not 
they're not fighting. <laughs> and, it, and it's interesting, right? Because we we're talking about animals. Animals don't recognize those lines on the map that we put there. Like we put those lines on that map and now we're fighting over those lines. It's like animals yeah. don't care about your borders or anything like that. They just cross right over because again, there's something about that. And part of paganism also was to have a structure in society where everyone contributed to that to to the to the community i guess right and community. what's that one saying it takes it takes two people to make a kid but a, a, a village to raise it or something or other like that well i believe that 100 percent. yeah i mean you could really right you're a father so it's like there's something about the love for a child that you can't describe there's certain feelings in life that you can't describe and the love for a, for a child is is one of those right true love like the, it, it's a feeling you can't you can't put words on it unless you experience it, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And so the, this black metal, death metal, dark metal, it, is it at a certain cadence or a certain frequency that they put it out? What's the hertz? Do they put it at a certain hertz in order to, again, depending on which? It almost sounds like there's a left hand path and right hand path in this in this genre. Uh, yeah. Do they shift that in order to shift the movie? Because sound alchemy, in my opinion, is a true thing. And there's there's and it's interesting because they they attribute Lucifer to being the first musician. Right. He's yeah. one of the first musicians. You have a, a lot of different. The, what was that one jazz player? The deal with the devil at the crossroads. I forget his name. But anyways, you have all these these myths with with the with the idea of music frequency cymatics where you're able to and right and we we incorporate alchemy into it you mentioned the crusaders well the templars if you read Fulconelli's the mystery of the cathedrals he believed that the templars had a secret now the the secret is we don't know what the secret was that's why it was a secret right but the that they allegedly left the instructions on how to create the magnum opus on these cathedrals okay somebody funded them where did the gold come from well it came from alchemy that's how they were able to create all these cathedrals and then what they did was they go okay well all the information is going to get wiped out well what if we just inscribe it directly on these cathedrals but only the initiated are going to know and when people were going to these cathedrals they were having divine experiences through the lights through yeah. the sound through the vibrations within these cathedrals, right? Cathedrals have organs and all these different things. So it was more of an experience for the regular person, of course, because they couldn't read, but they could look at images, right? Yeah. So in this, in this genre, do they do that? Do they mess with the frequency to make someone feel a certain type of way? I'm sure some bands have done it. Uh, I I've done it just with, you know, certain frequencies. If I'm trying to, make someone feel more elevated um especially now outside that genre what i do i'm very much so into you know metaphysics quantum physics and of course sounds gets in that the, the science of cymatics as you were saying and um you know I, I'll, I'll put frequencies in like 432 or uh 528 um i get into solfeggio um different different resonance for for different effects but yeah, and you have right one of the the tetragrammaton where it was reality was spoken into existence, right? Exactly. Speech, and John, right? The 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 word becomes the flesh. Like there's something about that, right? You get into into the whole aspect of writing. Can you talk to us a little bit about your song, The Wolf, and yeah. what that's about? Well, it's definitely it. The Wolf has one of the many mystical concepts. I want to bring to people mysticism that hopefully it soon it doesn't mystify anyone because it's all um you know known information that everyone has but the the wolf gets into the dichotomy of the whole the it gets into the dichotomy of the higher and lower self um that we all have within us basically the force that you know there's one force in us that is capable of you know making tremendous um greatness occur in the world and uh, to engender another renaissance or to do something fantastic where there's another force in us too that's extremely negative it's the polarity and it can uh, it can cause someone to never 
uh, reach their dreams. And um, that exists in everybody, that, that, that dichotomy and polarity. So I kind of wanted to make a song about that and show a guy who left insanity and derealization and, uh, you know, he, he, be, he becomes a, a personification of power, um, control and, and uh, wealth in, in, in health and abundance. You know, the guy that he was before was a very uh, mercurial individual, but it shows the transformation in the music video. And I, I played both characters um one is uh struggling with with drugs and alcohol which luckily i am sober uh on a year and a half almost now um but thank you so much but uh yeah so it was an intense video to do and my my fiance thank god she's a fashion designer and actual artist she fits into the family so so brilliantly but she she did my costumes yeah well i i like the way that you write the you do portray the transmutation of the <laughs> of the character within it, right? And you're showing the the ups and downs. And I think that a lot of people can relate to this because life is ups and downs. And I think a lot of people can see and, and how you're saying the I've heard you say before that you you've always been more of a, a lone wolf growing up. And it's interesting because you went from being in a band to now doing an entire album by yourself. You played all of the instruments and all that. Did you do that because you didn't want to? The reason why my show is the Juan on Juan is because I can count on Juan to show up every yeah. single time. And you know what I'm saying? Like we're born. What do they say? We're born alone and we die alone. So it's like, and again, I'm not saying it don't love family and stuff like that. But again, I can always count on myself to get something done. Is that why you did the approach with the new album, like everything by yourself? Well, with that, I did it with uh, Keith Wallen um, from Breaking Benjamin. And then I, I did the lyrics and we I, you know, I had my piano with me. So we were able to come up with ideas. But he did a lot of the um, music. He recorded the guitar. I, I did the vocals um, and I did piano. Of course, Blasco, my manager, always puts his input, and he, he's a profound artist as well. So that you know, we we have a, quite a team. But there's a record that I did uh, called Prehistoric Technology, where I'm on the guitar. Uh, I'm also on multiple other instruments, mostly like bazooki, sitar, bass, keyboard, and I did vocals. And then there's one album I did. It hasn't been released yet, but there's a couple songs that I want to release. I did with Ryan Green, where I played literally the drums, the bass, the guitar, the piano, vocals. Um, I did literally every single thing. And when I would go home and I was supposed to go to sleep, I wouldn't. I would just go ahead and start making soundscapes and industrial tracks to go into the next day's session, bring a USB of what I did, and then go back to work. <laughs> I mean, it was it was intense, and I, and I want to release a lot of that album. There's some songs in there that are just we we always Ryan and I think we did something very sacred. And when you're saying about Lone Wolf and stuff, you know, with that record, I did experience um, more creativity and safe, kind of sacred moments. Like I captured something direct from the source that didn't get dialed out by anyone's error and thinking or something like that. Um, and so that was fascinating, but sometimes I do believe, you know, when you write with a partner or something like that too, just, you know, uh, two people doing one thing, three people, not too many people, but you can start to tap into an energy together. Um, Especially someone you love, right? I mean, that's yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Like my fiance and I, when we, we, we write, you know, our scripts and stuff like that, like that, that, that power is just, we're, we're traveling to the same place and it becomes way more powerful, you know, than, than being alone. So Wes, you've done music, obviously you've done acting, you come from a family of actors, you could kind of say that you're in the family business in, in, a, in a sort of way. I can relate to you, I've, I work for my dad, you know, we work together so I can know how difficult that can be sometimes working with family and, and being in that position. Which do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy music? Do you enjoy acting? What is it that you enjoy the most? If you had to pick one thing to, to stick to it. For me, the music and the acting comes from the same place. Um, 
martial arts and the cooking and stuff, I think is where I'm from going to a different area, but music and acting ident are identical for me with, with the, the enjoyment. Uh, maybe sometimes in the filmmaking process, I'll get more enjoyment out of writing a script than I could if I'm not on a set where there's some riffing allowed, but if a director is really wanting me to put my input into it and then take his or her uh, ideology and concept and to, to, to really access that, like, but they want to riff on it and do something really elevated. That's, that's the most exciting for me. Um, even if it's just directly, you know, line for line, no improv um, or improv, whichever way. But um, one of the, so we, we talked about alchemy sound, the incorporation of colors even. Right. Yeah. And one of the things I talk about a lot on this show is, right, you have sigil magic, which essentially are pictures and right, motion picture essentially is that. And I yeah. call these people the sorcerers of the subconscious because they're trying to sometimes write, write these archetypes and they want to talk to people on a much deeper level. It involves memetics, right, and, and the forming of culture. And I call them cinemagicians. And one of the quotes that has always stood out to me by Francis Ford Coppola is, I think cinema movies and magic have always been closely associated. The very earliest people who made films were magicians. Now, we can take magicians as like stage magicians, magic with a C or magic with a K, I believe is also involved. And they're like Crowley, right? with the, the, the esoteric and the occult, because there is something to that. Because can you walk us a little bit how you do you and again, do you invite something in? Do you step into something? How do you get into character and how? How is the process like does a director tell you be this way and you try to emulate however they're telling you to be or how does that how does that work what happens behind the scenes We can't hear you us we lost your your audio here Let's see but Yeah we lost you with the audio I think maybe try getting out and then stepping back in Yeah All right we'll wait for him to I guess he had another another alarm set off. He's been having alarms go off. And he had another one. So, yeah, but I'm just interested in, in seeing and knowing about what happens behind the scenes when it comes to different actors and portraying these characters and how the magic happens, right? So let's see if we have... We got you now? Uh, there someone we go. tried to call you're good. That's that, that energy. Sometimes people <laughs> they can feel you and they'll, <laughs> they'll call. <laughs> Especially if, if I'm writing something really profound, deep conversation. I'm working on some kind of soundtrack, and there's some really profound part. Bam! The phone call comes in. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I use a lot of psychology. Uh, I develop the idiosyncrasies of my character with the director. Kind of ask questions as soon as I have a kind of like a nice holographic image of who I'm playing. I I will really envision that character. I'll ask the character questions and they'll respond to me in my mind as I'm focusing. I want to get I want I want I'll even develop false memories as a character and not tell people what I was thinking of just to make the character seem more real and if you could pick up on something when you're watching it it's different but so I tap into that a lot. If I I use some spiritual methods too though if I'm if I'm playing a character like for instance I played a character with my friend who called me, my, my brother, Jesse, uh, he played Lamel and I played Lieutenant Colonel Rudder in the, D the movie D-Day, which was about the, um, you know, Battle of Point du Hawk, uh, part of the Omaha Beach situation, everything on, on, in Normandy and D-Day. When, uh, when I did that character, I knew I was playing a real man and he started off as a football coach. He was a very paternal, powerful figure. And I knew that I was only 27, 28, but I wanted to look like a man that was a little bit more of a chief that, that had some wisdom. I, I completely transformed myself with meditation. I mean, I would go into a bath every night saying things to the universe, asking the 
<clears throat> actual ghost of that individual is it okay if i portray you please guide me in my in my steps so that i don't offend your family and your legacy or my legacy my lineage my family can i please give you this character and sure enough i transformed i started to talk a little bit like this and i'd call people son on set that were all of them even though i was calling them son they're like okay he can call us son because he looks 48 50 kind of right now even though i was not even 30 yet but and I, I was meditating and I, I did use some herbs to help relax my body and, and to look at all this dialogue and to know that I had to say all these commands perfectly, flank left, flank right, A team, B team, all, all these staff sergeants, all these different names, and I couldn't mess it up. I had to do that as a leader and I, I was a captain in, our, in the wrestling team, so I did pull from my being a captain kind of and and – being a person that's very, a lot of my friends would say when they're around me, I'm very encouraging and I've tried to build people up positively with real info, but I never had any, I've never been in combat before, of course, seen anyone, you know, never been in, in, in battle or did any tours, uh, but I have been in hostile situations, but I pull off from all that. Um, and that was, that, that character was just very powerful. Um, and I believe that I became him and then I kind of walked away from that character. Sometimes when I'm done and I do a movie, if, if a character I become is a part of me that scares me at all, I, I will like bury an object or like a rock and say, that's the character. And I'm, I'm ejecting that character out of me. Cause I became a character in assault on VA 33, where I played a character in Adrian Rybakov. That's where I developed the false memories, but he was a, uh, he's a Russian terrorist that has a syndicate, uh, pretty military, like a militia. These group, this group is very powerful and they, they all raid a hospital and I'm just looking for my brother out of love. Everyone else is in it for the money. But when I played a character like that and start getting into the dark genius or anything like that, 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 that can be a little frightening. <laughs> um, so I, I had to definitely bury a rock after that in New York. I was in Buffalo and I was like, I part ways with the character, but I take the wisdom, but I have to leave away the energy. So aren't you afraid of, of, of something staying Wes, if if you invite something in, because right, ask and you shall receive. Mm -hmm. It's like maybe sometimes you'll receive the an unwelcome guest, right, by doing that. Because you're 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 right. There's evocation, invocation, and yeah. you're you're willingly right. We we're talking about the African cultures earlier before we start recording, and right, Vodun Voodoo comes from them. They're about invoking this deity entity into them, and they let themselves be used as a vessel in a sort of way that's the true shamanic acting too yes. that that acting all came from i mean in every culture there was these spiritual elevated shamans that were the medicine they almost i mean more important than the chief even because everyone's wellness was attached to the shamans but i know there's a there's a way to do it um and a, there's a very unsafe way of doing it you know if someone's really gonna do it the way they do in siberia <clears throat> where they're drinking vodka and then asking an energy to come into them or like in, in voodoo where they do that too voodoo obey all that they have to be very careful and know know how to do it properly like a, a, a as detailed as a lawyer um, or a doctor that, that knows those rules and stuff because i i have I'm, I'm heavily into you know mysticism and practicing practical magic and stuff and i, I always take every caveat super seriously um you know like I would never call in something uh, certain words or, you know, certain certain words I know in Sumerian, for example, uh, that are just I've I've experimented with those. <laughs> there, um, we we've had a lot of paranormal properties in the family. You know, it, it, one of the second most haunted place in the world for a second. Um, yeah. So when we when I would bring friends over and everyone would have the same experience, even if that person was nihilistic, if that person was spiritual that person had their hand in both it, it just when they saw that it, it was it was hilarious we we asked someone that was in the band since you don't believe in ghosts and everything take a walk down the hallway over there there's this hallway that looks so intense he's like no i can't i'm like why you don't believe in anything though right you're you don't believe in the uh metaphysical and an energy is like well no i don't and i'm like then why can't you walk down there because i can feel something i'm like what the fuck I'm, excuse me what's that <laughs> yeah i feel something well like, yeah that's because it's a there's spiritual energy in there man and then um yeah it's it there, there's a force that he didn't want to connect with but it wasn't it wasn't that negative in that house you know that there was one force that was very intense but a lot of positive um 
my bro Jesse again that I just mentioned I mentioned before he was with me there and we we had a beautiful experience where we saw like orbs and stuff floating beautiful blue orbs that were just there and we took pictures and we still have those you're talking about the la 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 lori mansion is that the one that you're talking about yeah that's the one and and this is what really blows my mind when it comes to people who have zero belief there's you have the people who are completely atheists who don't believe in anything and it's like there are people reality is we don't even understand consciousness number, number to begin with we don't even understand the nature of reality and i believe that there are that reality is much deeper and more sophisticated than we are led to believe okay and obviously we have god right but we do have in my opinion realities layered on top of one another and you're talking about burying a perhaps a talisman or something uh, an amulet of sorts when you're done with a character putting that character in that doing a sort of ritual if you will and and burying it to to get rid of that and almost have some sort of closure well in my opinion architecture is the same thing it can hold memories there's something there's something about wood wood there's something about i forgot what what was the fact that they told me they told me that when the electrical grid right because i've seen you do also the these wild west movies these these cowboy movies and i forgot who told me it was something along the lines of when the electric when the electric grid was introduced the amount of paranormal incidences went down or something like that it was like something weird almost like the the electromagnetic frequencies suppress that but a lot of these old time buildings were wood right yeah so there's something in my opinion of these places that hold these energies and where right, you had a, a guy who was what was he uh, he was an uh, uh an atheist and didn't believe in anything but he wouldn't go down the <laughs> yeah. and, and and whenever we would ask the question he would he would say a real rational response that was always connected to metaphysical <laughs> yeah you know, like proving himself the truth he's, literally it's always like he knew all along inside that it was true but um yeah i mean th- th- everything holds energy uh, um that's why i'm huge about you know my the specific incenses that i burn or make or or uh rose oil in water if you make a little if you just take like a spray bottle or even buy the spray bottles that are empty and just ready for you to put whatever you want in there, a little bit of a safe uh, rose oil in some rose water with water. If you spray that, that's like three times the strength of sage and Palo Santo. The rose is, is very powerful for removing negative vibes and stuff. You know, I, I'll, I'll sometimes wash my, my body in it. It's uh, I really believe in it, rose oil and stuff. Um, some people I've noticed are, are into that too. I, I'll be walking around uh, Southern California. I'll see people selling rose Palo Santo and sage tied together. I'm like, these people know exactly what they're doing because they're giving you every missile for negative energy right there. And, you know, rose being the freaking most nuclear. And how does it feel, right? The, the being related to nick cage right obviously he's your father being a cage has that helped you in your acting or your career or has that hindered you a bit what's that been like to be in the right in the family with what i consider one of the greatest actors of all time right one of the most prolific actors of all time and how how is that how was that growing up having nick cage as a father well he's just always been a profound father um uh, our connection has been very powerful always um you know then we 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 would connect on philosophy and mysticism psychology all kinds of stuff science you know astronomy acting i mean art mostly philosophy my fiance actually has a degree all uh, in philosophy as well as her um artistic uh certifications and stuff but you know we would just my dad and i would always sometimes we would improv together we just we would just create together do a scene together what if we had like a two or three hour drive we just improv together and he he was always realistic with me he told me that 
when that day does come, when I start working and stuff, I'll notice that I might have to work three times harder than I thought I would have to, or maybe 10 times harder than my friends because I'm coming into this and people have preconceived notions or beliefs. Um, and I'm going to have to be it positive or negative. I'm going to have to really show that I'm my own entity. So I, I got that picture very quick when I started dealing with abuse from acting instructors, when I go to acting school and stuff that never happened in Stella Adler, uh, which is my method. I, I do Stella Adler style acting and my, you know, the style that my dad has mentioned and kind of my own style. I think it's, I think everyone develops their own style. Everyone's a book, you know, you develop your own style throughout life and whether you immortalize it by making a book about it or not, I'm working on a book, but, um, you know, my, my dad and I would always practice together our craft and Stella Adler taught me a lot about, you know, the relaxation they get into with the imagination. I mean, I of course have Im implemented some stuff I've learned from hypnotism, which I'm into psychology, you know, I, I make audios that are hypnotic for people and I, I do that for myself. You know, I, I've made my own audios to develop a character or to, to program myself to be a certain way or something. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think that, and, and also my, my, my father is one of those individuals that's just infinitely intelligent. Uh, he's like my grandpa, August. I mean, that man was so intelligent that people described sometimes it was almost like scary for them because he was like an encyclopedia. He knew everything. And I tried it with him when my grandpa was still alive, asking him a question that maybe someone couldn't answer. He really did know the specific eternal answer to that. I was like, what the, it was fascinating. But he invented this thing in, in uh, it's called a tactile dome. People can go see it in the, the um, in, in San Francisco, the tactile dome. Uh, it, it's just, I think it's at the ob observatory or something. Um, something like that. But it's, it's a sensory deprivation area that raises the IQ and stuff. It's fascinating. You said the tactile dome here. Let's see here. Let's look it up. Where was it at? Uh, San Francisco. Made by Dr. August Coppola. He was, my grandpa was a doctor at 21. He really took academia seriously. Um, Is it this one here? Yes, that's the one. So this is for what you said. It's a sensory deprivation. Yeah. And my apologies. I said at the observatory, that's Los Angeles. This is the Exploratorium in uh, San Francisco. The, uh, yeah. So when you go inside there, it's completely tactile. It's, it's giving you a connection to your haptic sensory. So it's all based off touch. The lights go off and you have to find your way out of the kind of maze and what it does is it stimulates your other senses, being our hearing, of course, and our touch sensory, and maybe some other ones that we don't know about yet. But it's it's pretty fascinating. I mean, he he wrote a lot of books, and you know, even my uncle Francis, my, my father, we we all say how much he's inspired every one of us, and we were all emulating kind of a a spark that came from him. Um, that can be kind of intimidating, right? Trying to, those are big shoes to fill. Very big shoes. And he, he's a very, you know, every time I work with energy healers or the, the real true clairvoyance, and there's a lot of people out there that aren't, but there really are the ones that are really, they see how close we are. Um, he, he's, uh, I mean, we still raise the glass on, on February 16th because he doesn't feel, he doesn't feel dead at all, which is interesting. Yeah, that is interesting, and, and I saw that your father said that he wasn't going to stop acting right anytime soon. So hopefully he does. And I just I just finished watching Dream Scenario, and I loved every second of it. it was It was an, an amazing, amazing movie, and yeah. I, I just loved how dynamic Nick Cage is, right, and how versatile he is, right. He is a of different layers and um like i've always said you know he's he's a thousand years ahead of his time the where where he's thinking mentally with some of these things and he, we're both very into what we were talking about earlier about how some of the first actors were shamans for me art there's certainly words that show that shows itself with its prefix its seed uh and the branches that that word becomes you know 
with its its origins, like the word art itself being in the word articulation, the first three letters of articulation. So to me, it's like art is the highest form of communication. And my dad's really into the message behind his characters, and so am I. I don't want to play characters that I don't resonate with or understand in some way. There's there's a character I had to play recently that's a um, kind of a hybridization of two people that really existed. And that person, someone I do not connect with at all, but I wanted to play that dark of a character. It's a movie I did with my fiance with Mel Gibson and 50 Cent. That movie will make a lot of people, especially young ladies, be extra careful in the world. Um, you know, there's some, there's some pred- predator evil individuals that are very frightening. And I, you know, I've, I've seen, I've seen some pretty dark individuals. Like I've seen insanity, you know, with, with where, what I grew up and I've seen some scary folks out there. So I was able to pull from some memories of mine and, you know, hopefully this character will, will make people more uh, circumspect and careful. And that's, that's whenever I play a villain, I want to show with that villain's dark side, something so dark that maybe it's not appealing. People don't find it cool at all. And they want to stay away from that. That's, that's kind of, you know, my character I did in Assault VA-33, he didn't have that kind of true, he, he, he was very angry and he was a warrior and he did things the wrong way. You know, you can't invade it. You can't go into a hospital and take hostages. That's messed up. He was doing stuff the wrong way. War, a displaced warrior. Whereas this character really, you know, I believe serial killers. I believe rapists. I believe all these people, they're parasites. It's something that needs to be, yes. you know, edited out of our, our people. We, we, we got to find a way to edit it out of our, our, our humans, the human race, we have to all come together and edit that out with spirituality and, and help people fix their trauma. Cause the other way of doing it would suck where if, if we had to get in there with, you know, technology and actually start to play God with what we're creating, that would be really uh, messed up to edit, edit certain mentalities out of humanity. But I mean, you know, there's certain things that do have to stop, you know, the, 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 the fact that this, these guys out there, did these things and th- th- there's just a certain cruelty that I don't like in the world. And that, that it's interesting that that led me to martial arts, my martial arts kind of life, you know, it, it all came from, I, I hate violence. So I want to know every single dynamic of martial arts. And of course I think martial arts goes into discipline. It goes beyond violence. But I, I when I'm doing what I, I practice now for like 10 years, I've been doing the more self-defense battlefield grade stuff. That's not beautiful or, artistic in any way it's scientific and clinical and horrible and stuff you would never want to have to use but when i get into that i'm only into that because i i really believe that everyone needs to protect their body like a temple and if someone's trying to hurt you that that that's such a statement and a violation that that soul is trying to inflict pain on another souls and dominate their will that has to be we have to learn how to protect ourselves in like third party defense where you protect a relative or a friend family knowing how to do that. I, I never knew how to, the, the real way of doing that. Like there's certain moves where you push the person you're trying to protect the side and then throw a kick. And it's like, it's interesting, but that that's yeah. why I told you I wanted to learn jujitsu to be able to, cause I, I'm in Florida, bro. So we got, we carry all the time. It's different, but yeah. it's like, what if you don't have that? Right. What are you going to do? And a lot of these practices, they use leverage. They use the that energy. They take that energy, and you see it. They transmute it. Like I love, I love watching old like Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee videos of actual martial, and it was amazing, right? The way they're able to take that energy and and turn it around on itself, or even any of the Gracies, like right, watching them. They're just, they're so limber and flexible, and it's like, wow, this dude's gonna tap from that, and they 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 don't like they don't and it's it's amazing i mean that so bruce lee i was talking about him yesterday when i was at the film post with my friends see if everyone we were all talking uh bruce lee was really truly a, a, a scientific and spiritual genius i mean he had a high iq high sq high bq eq he knew and he was one of the godfathers of it all and that system Jeet Kune Do, how he, he made a theatrical but then practical version of it so you're the one you can use on a movie set and then one you can use in actual combat and some of those moves that he developed are very 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 uh they're perfect I, I, they're perfect concepts of 
telegraphing your knee with lifting your leg up a little bit and the guy looks down you're coming with a back knuckle like that that kind of stuff i mean he was clearly tapping into something amazing um i call those people solar flare individuals kind of like bruce lee hendrix um brando in his own way they there's some or or some so many philosophers or people that we never met maybe alexander or something you know these people tap into something it's very powerful that's why i believe in being centered and not not going too far into anything but like to being like centered always because i've you know i've i've gone i've 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 done a spiritual i've had many spiritual awakenings and i've had spiritual awakenings that were not successful and that was scary to 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 for people to see for me to be around um for them to be around like when i when i did a kundalini awakening and then i i didn't no one looks at this there's all these yoga places and there's 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 all these gurus online thousands of them saying if you access kundalini without a guru is dangerous and they're, they're all telling the truth and no one listens if they're <laughs> some of these people are trying to activate themselves and, and awaken and it's like maybe that's not a good idea to do right now when you're doing stunt driving or something i don't know you know it's it's like people have to kind of stay more balanced the the imagination right and memory that's something that's always right anima right animism you have carl young that talks about the anima you have the the, the the collective conscious the unconscious the subconscious whatever you want to refer to it as do you use any memory techniques in your work and if if so can you share some of those techniques for uh with us of course um one of the best memory techniques i've ever used is was devised by shakespeare uh which i think he's also one of those individuals that are just you know true polymath brilliant uh it's called the loci method and i, I use it for memorization of my lines also if I want to make a, a memory anchor, I call them, I kind of like expand a little bit upon it. Like, you know, like when you want to shut the stove off or try and remember if you place something in its perfect location and then you're wondering, did I do that right? And then you're kind of like forgetting and there's an anxiety of, oh shoot, did I do it or not? I'll, I'll make little memory markers. Like I'll remember a green triangle or something when I do something. And then when I'm driving or do something, I'm like, oh, did I do that? Bam, that triangle comes up and I remembered it. So that that's kind of the same method, loci method where, shakes the, the 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 memory technique is let's say you have your lines in front of you and no one would have any trouble remembering to be or not to be for example i would hope and you would imagine the number two then letter b and then you can remember like a shoelace knot and then let number two and then b and you kind of remember the graphics of it or or just remember the graphics of what your character is saying and you'll see how you actually really take a photographic print of that what you looked at and it just comes right out um if if there's any and it's interesting how, how how confidence is so connected to it if if someone's intimidated and some roles will intimidate us and there's a role there, there, there's a scene where maybe you're even doing a speech so it's like doing a speech already being in a scene plus you're doing a speech within the scene to people watching you have to be so calm to remember all this stuff and to really visualize if the person's saying uh I did a character once they, they, they did a monologue. They just wrote it immediately. And they're like, can you get this in five minutes? I said, sure, I'll try. And I looked and we got it because I, you know, my character was talking about two kilograms of <clears throat> something illegal. He was a dangerous character. So I thought to myself, all right, I'll imagine two keys, the actual keys for opening doors. And I remembered that and just came right up, you know, the, uh, so really getting the graphics of, of what you're trying to say. And that's how you remember it in a three dimensional way. Yeah, I've used the memory palace technique before where you yeah. create the rooms and you fill them up with whatever it is that you're trying to remember. And the, the, the wackier, the better, because it's easier to remember. It is. You know? And 100%. When, you, when you're acting, Wes, like in front of, of uh, when you're on a set, how many people can be looking at you at one time? Well, if you're doing your scene you know, like we did a movie in Arkansas, my fiance and I, and we're all working to get perfect driving. I was doing a stunt, some stunt driving um, in a movie before that, uh, but this wasn't really stunt driving. It was just more accuracy and stuff. I mean, the whole entire crew and, and cast, everyone's looking through the, the monitors and 
um, so many people are watching the car, making sure it's going to the same place. And so you can have 30 people looking at you. I mean, you can have, uh, you know, some scenes where, you know, the director's not by the monitor. I know Werner Herzog likes to step away from the monitor. So it can, it can be a lot, um, including the uh, thespians you're working with. But, you know, I, I have always, when I do my scenes, I, I really just try to, make sure that I, I do a memory palace like you're like you were just talking about like I, I I know what the scene looks like and everything needs to be completed in the blocking what one is and what my last mark is what the last line and these these everyone I'm working with these individuals their physical physical or mental or verbal cues of when I'm supposed to do something so the the end of certain lines to know when I have to go in and what's being done in a, in a, in a palace that especially auditions, if you go in there and you, you have a room that you're going to build and you actually just build that in front of one and then walk out after saying something really polite and memorable, they're going to be like, okay, that who's that guy. And they're going to try to, cause it's just like NCIS. I did that. I, I, I played a really scary British character that was like, you know, just the, the guy, the guy that came in my mind, it was just a download of a universe of, some tough British guy that, that someone could hit him with a champagne bottle and the bottle would just break. And he'd be like, nice going, man. That's a nice one. Lad. It was very like intense. And I knew everyone was going to go in to play a, a Russian character. And I, I speak pretty good Russian and I, I played that Russian character, but there was a guy from Moscow that was against me, you know, and I, I knew this guy is going in and for Russian, they're going to give him the real thing. So I'm, I became the big British pit bull, you know, like scary character and, and bam, I landed it. And I, I built that room in there. I, I, I had his voice perfectly. I showed it to friends even, and they asked me to come in again. And bam, I was on NCIS with LL Cool J doing that, you know, uh, and Andrea Bordeaux, all those amazing people. Um, yeah, I mean, Suzanne Saltz, that, that was a great team. And it was fun. You know, uh, TV is a different pace than, uh, and I think that would make me, I don't know how many relatives I have that have done TV shows. I think they try to, there's been a couple limited things, but. I'm trying to, the this, this script I'm writing is TV, you know, so I'm, I'm just, it's been, it's more eternal. Yeah, and I also saw that you did a comic book with your dad, too, a while ago, right? Yeah, and that, that one I really want to have happen in some way, even if we have to do that fully animated, it's fine, you know, because it's just, what it's what it gets into voodoo, and oh, so it's amazing. So, I did, I have this, this, this series called The Chosen One, and... Yeah. Right. I'd love to send you a copy, Wes, and I have some other stuff too here that I have. Against the Saturn cube? Saturn? Yeah, the the Saturnian cube. Love it, man. You're really into this. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. And I have the homunculus owner's manual too. I don't know if you know what a homunculus is, Wes. Do you know what a homunculus is? (laughs) I'm looking at it, trying to dissect it based on. No, don't look at that. That, That's. Homunculus. Yeah, homunculus. I'll I'll send you some. If you got a PO box, I'll send you the goodies, and you can read through what uh, an alchemical homunculus is. And reminds me of like a, a manticore or something. It's a an artificially right. created being through the use of alchemy. I mean, there we go. Like so, the, the, a small the, man, miniature human, homunculus. Yeah. And That's why I was really calm, and I knew it was there was a <laughs> yeah. That's so fun. yeah, I I actually ordered a copy of the. Of the one that comes, it came together in the. So you say you wanted to make a a motion, a TV show out of that comic book. We tried, you know, we 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 did, and it. Uh, I I have actual scripts made for for that, um, and it almost happened so many times. All of 2021 was me working on on that, um, delegating that. But you know, I I think it needs to happen. Uh, you know, there's, there's, he, the voodoo child is like an angel of voodoo. He, he, he's someone that got resurrected after a terrible thing happened to his abolitionist father uh, by a, a horrific organization. Um, and he is told by a voodoo priest to set the world straight and to never rest until the world is set straight. So to pretty much annihilate evil in a, a dark way as well. Um, and he, you know, he, uh, it's, it's intense. It's, it's definitely one of my favorite characters is spawn. And it's in that spawn Batman kind of realm. Maybe if you wanted to go Marvel, 
a character that would be as dark as him would be like maybe kind of like a nightcrawler because he, he 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 looks like a zombie. He looks like a a chimerical being that's of some kind of Saturnine background, but he's good. And Ghost Rider's like that. Um, I like characters that use their darkness for good because I feel like that's my superpower. Is I mm. uh, if I was always aware of how dangerous the world could be. I was always very empathic when I was a kid. I, I even started crying in Greece because I felt this guy's sadness next to me. So when I started picking up on dangerous people, I kind of like started tapping into being. I, it's it's almost like if you see rage instead of running away from rage to overpower the rage with the more intense like <laughs> it was what I was into and that's why I got into such aggressive music heavy metal extreme metal black metal, uh, but you know it was beautiful. My my dad played Ghost Rider and I saw how that manifested and I saw him dress up a in Halloween as Ghost Rider once and how it was meant to be and then I wound up doing voice work for the character you know and they. They needed some really intense growling stuff. And I, I th- this was funny. I, I went into the studio and I, I, they wanted something demonic and scary. So I, I, I gave him ancient, you know, Hebrew, Greek. Uh, I gave him like all these old you know, Norse. I gave him like an- ancient indigenous languages from North America, South America. I, I gave him all this stuff. And afterwards, they, they actually, I believe, were trying to get ready to sage the room because they were worried that I had brought in something. <laughs> Maybe we did, but... They're, that character, you know, when they were like, "What are you speaking?" and then they're like, "Why? Why? Why is he know ancient Egyptian? It's a dead language." I was like, "No, no, it's not." <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. That's that's you, you. You broke out the grimoires. I heard you say one time that you're that as a kid you'd read these books that your father had laying around. Some books on the occult and mysticism. Did did is that? Did he have books on the occult? And, do you remember any of those books? What they were? There were we've shared books and just from philosophers that are fascinating Israel Regardi, like the book garden of pomegranates, uh, people who are into just mysticism and of course, following the light. Um, and you know, I, of course I have original books from Aleister Crowley, actual ones from the sixties. And, and, um, I think I have a couple of books, books from the twenties that are, are very powerful. I mean, you know, the, the, the mathematics of the book and what it teaches you how to do. And if there's a couple pages of these books, especially I noticed with magic and theory and practice, some of these things just don't make sense to the eye immediately. And then you start seeing how the numbers and numerology, all this stuff connects together. And then you start getting them like, and then you start applying it. Uh, but, you know, we, we would talk about all this stuff, like, you know, the, um, I think we're, you know, like for example, with Christianity, mysticism and Christianity, how how a cross, if you, if you were to, to, to make a cross with paper and fold it all together, it would become a cube. And it's kind of gets into that fourth dimension, the cubic space, the the different dimensions. And like you were saying with, with reality, I believe it's a matrix of parallel dimensions that are all different. We're, of course, in the one of cause and effect, but there's other ones in fourth dimension i really believe fifth dimensions where you have that that consciousness and light but i back to animism like basically we're just in an an animation of existence and force i mean there's a spiritual there's an energy and then this energy is so powerful that made the universe that matter started to materialize out of the energy and uh that's that's what's really fascinating to me is when i when i really focus and meditate and I actually do do my 26 minutes a day or fast for seven days straight safely. I tap into this and I really think about how, yeah, this, this world that we're in, this is just a, it's, it's intent. The materialization of intent, something intended for the universe to have kind of a centrifugal vibe going on where everything's spinning and you have this, the sun and, you know, there, there's this, this solar system, just the fact that it's a system shows that there is an intelligent attempt and, and, and intention and that all forms. Yeah, that's why with the alien stuff, you know, like that's why I was so huge into, I've studied as much as I can of the earth. My first favorite little, it wasn't even a toy. It was a globe where I could touch areas and remember. Some people think it's flat, Wes. What do you, you think it's flat? You think it's a globe? <laughs> Definitely not flat. <laughs> it concerns me when people think it's, Yeah. <laughs> Because of the 
just the geometrics it's, it's, it's light being on one side of the earth with the other one you know it's a being... pizza box bro it's a it's, <laughs> it's flat it's a pancake floating through uh space yeah. like that's what they yeah and i really loved your dad in the color out of space right the the the, the lovecraft movie i think tommy chong was in that one i think it was and the the lovecraftian aspects of uh, the Cthulhu mythos that is used by certain occult groups. And that's why acting and all this memory, the Mundus Imaginalis, that all interests me because I think we're tapping into another dimension, how you're talking about, like, right, the cube, the, the, and the interdimensionalism of that. And the Tesseract, right? You have the, with Hinton, with the, with the Tesseract and the idea of other realms and, the theosophical society took that and they they formed their own ideas behind that right the astral planes and all these different other realities in which they could uh do you have you ever done any astral projection wes i've worked with astral projection once in england and uh, i did it with the an astral projection it's, it's a non-psychoactive smoke blend that preps you for that spiritually um so it wasn't hallucinating or, or anything or tripping on like peyote or like ayahuasca but i i astral projected and like i i've always noticed whenever that's happened to me I, I come back tired that's why a lot of friends of mine who do it on purpose they they'll take a three mile run afterwards you know just to get it out of their system um the kind of fatigue you wake up with from those those projections it's interesting i mean that you know what I, I definitely connect with the these dimensions and I think meditation is one of the best ways to just always be um, aligned with that uh, consciousness. Well, Wes, did you, do you have any final thoughts as we close out the show here towards the ending? Do you have anything else you want to leave the listeners with any, any thoughts of wisdom or any upcoming projects or any, anything you want to leave the listeners with? Definitely, yeah. I guess with with animism, just to know that spirit was the, it's the first element. Even people say there's these four elements, and the pentacle is, is not a satanic thing. It's uh, the five elements, spirit being the first, the master, one of them all. You know, the spirit is a true element, and I think that you know, magic in its most basic form is life, and the and the desire to expand, to grow. There's there's quite a lot of magic, so I believe that maybe one day. As time goes on, I can help the world and, and, and do what I'm meant to do. And part of that is to bring, I, I really believe I have a goal and my, my vision is not just for me and, and to make sure my, fam my, my family is first, of course, but, but like everyone should be. But I, I believe that there could be another renaissance. I think there could be another age where certain more elevated spiritual realizations and concepts are more accepted everyone's kind of understood on that there's meditations in school there's the science spirituality art and everything else being connected in a way that never has before so like one of one of the ways that you know with the renaissance like that there was a lot of there wasn't that much violence going on during the renaissance and i think beautiful things would happen if people in on the whole world tried to make another one of those renaissances and you know do something profound i think uh I want to elevate humanity and that's why these books are going to be, you know, so interesting, I think. And uh, I think we all have wisdom within us. We all, we were all encoded and programmed in some way that's to, to be something profound and we can always tap into our higher self. You know, that's how Plato says, we know everything already. We just have to remember. Right? Exactly. We just have to that's tap so into true. that. So again, that's why I find this all fascinating. And, and the reason I asked you how many people were, were watch you when you do these lines, cause I, I, I was thinking, I have this thing coming up soon where I was thinking about taking a shot at stand up comedy for the first oh. time ever. But here's the thing. I have a show that right now, thousands of people will listen to this. Wes, you know, there's going to be yeah. thousands of people who are going to listen to this. I have zero problems with that. It doesn't bother me right now. I can do a live show. I've had 2,000 people watch me live on, on, on a computer. Yeah. But in person, it's a whole different animal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I felt that at 
um, the Palms with that show we did with West the West Cage show when there was that that was a huge in the Pearl Room. That was a that was a huge turnout. And when there's a lot of people in one room, it gets pretty divine. I mean, mm-hmm. if it's all done properly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you, but I feel with with putting out works like my comic book and my podcast, and and this is this is my art. This is my this is how I express myself. With so many people interacting with my work. I have a heightened sense of synchronicity sometimes, like heightened incidences of synchronicities. And it's almost like they're, they're, it's it's too good to be true sometimes. And it's like, well, how many times does it have to happen for it to just be a coincidence or an actual phenomenon, right? Like, how, when are you going to start to realize it? And that's what I love about synchronicities. Like, you can either ignore them or you can take them for what they are and, and take them as... I, I love synchronicities or even deja vu. I, I think that it's reality and life leaving you breadcrumbs like hey you're on the right track like i've been here before like some part of me has been here before therefore i know i've i know i opened all the right doors i knew i I know i took all the the right turns i knew i did everything right because i've already been here before right yeah so absolutely yeah wes dude you killed it really enjoyed our conversation hopefully you'll come back on again and absolutely yeah, dude. So, anything you want to leave the listeners with? A plug your your stuff for one time at Weston Cage. Yeah, definitely. Oh. Uh, yeah, check out my Instagram. It's a, a sanctuary of a lot of creativity, and it keeps you in touch with what I'm doing. Also, there's I get into some comedy on there too, with some abstract humor. Um, so that's at Weston Cage Coppola, and then there's a www dot West Cage uh, Emporium. That's where I still kind of release some of my. I, I do work with with frequencies a lot. Those audios I make are really are really potent. I use them myself. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I make like talismans and stuff, and do these. Well, there's a lot of, of, of film work coming up. Um, you know, I just, I, I heard from um, everyone that there's going to be a theatrical release to one of the films I did. That's with my fiance and, and a Seafock bar, and we're just looking forward to that. When can we expect? The book, uh, do you have a date for that yet? Or is that still in the works? It should be, by the end of this year, I should have everything. It's a shorter read, the first one, um, everything done. And then I'm going to release that probably uh, 2026. Okay. And then any upcoming projects that are going to be recent? I'm going to put this out next week, so it'll be fresh in people's. You have any projects that are coming out anytime soon or still in post-production type of stuff? We have a, that film that we did with my fiance, a C-fuck bar, uh, Mel Gibson, 50 Cent, called Boneyard. Boneyard. Be coming. Uh, I also did a movie with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, my friend James Colin Bresick, incredible director, uh, called Darkness of Man. Um, yeah, there's that Western I did. I I kind of forgot it uh, about it, though. It didn't, it, yeah. But uh, then after that, there's also um, Crescent City, which we did in Arkansas. Cool. I'll keep an eye out for those. I wrote those down so I can check them out. And make sure to post all your links in the description. Wes, thank you again, bro. Really appreciate you, dude. And yeah, stick around. I'll, I'll get your, your P.O. box so I can send you a couple copies of The Chosen Juan. Um, everyone, make sure to go follow Wes. Make sure to check out the show, tjojp.com chosenjuan.com sign up for the kickstarter of the chosen juan issue two and get your homunculus owners manual all that good stuff appreciate everybody and as always catch you on the next one blessed be thank you brother